welcome everybody. Uh, it's a it's a uh, pleasure to be here and a uh, uh, pleasure to to, to welcome Zhang Chin. Um, and one of the really really nice things about there are two nice things of this job. One one is the students, uh, which is a constant uh, delight, and the other thing is that as you, you know you get to meet amazing people sometimes. And tonight you listen to one of those. Um, and um, the word amazing is not uh, uh, adequate. Actually, uh, the thing about China today is it makes almost every word not very useful. <laughs> Just not very useful. Uh, because, of course, what's going on in China, which doesn't mean what goes on in the nation of China, but also the way China is in the world, and the world is in, in China, a much more uh, complex question, also a very ancient question, because what you have seen, of course, in the, in the last uh, 20, 30 years is, is a kind of renaissance uh, of China, which is a return to a previous moment in which China was, uh, um, you know, uh, a, a kind of um, uh, a source of uh, philosophy and thinking and economy, I invention, technology, and so on. So in, in a world in which uh, you are only as strong as what you share, which I think is the world that we live in today, it has always been in the past that China was one of the main engines of this kind of uh, uh, sharing. And, and we have returned to this moment. And I think this is what we are experiencing is uh, uh, a much more uh, rigorous world in which the sharing is more uh, uh, broad. But surely uh, what is happening today may be the biggest experiment in human history. Even if in China we have 3,000, 4,000 years of, of culture, probably the biggest experiment we face today is that Seven billion people will be living in cities by the year 2050. It's an enormous experiment, and a huge proportion of that experiment is, is in China. So China, for very many reasons, has been a teacher uh, in, in these recent years. And then within this great experiment of China, there are certain key people who represent, in a way, the highest ambition of this uh, uh, experiment, and, and we are really lucky to have such a person with us uh, uh, tonight. Um, is uh, Soho China, I think, is, is you uh, formed the, the firm in, in 1995, so it has not even uh, 20 years. But you have to understand that 20 years, almost 20 years in China, uh, is something like 100 years uh, in the previous uh, century, maybe more. Um, within China, if you return to any city after six months, it, it's a different city. Uh, I love the fact that Buckminster Fuller used to give lectures, uh, and when he would return to a lecture hall after 10 years, he will say, almost none of his body has come back, only his glasses. Yeah. Everything else has been uh, replaced. Uh, if you visit a city in China, it will not be the same city you saw before. Almost all of the biology will have been uh, uh, replaced. Soho is a really astonishing company, uh, 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 led by an astonishing couple, of which one is with us tonight, astonishing person, person a, a role model in so many ways. Uh, your career is, is a, has a kind of amazing trajectory by which I don't mean so much from, from, uh, from a quiet place to an enormous global place. I mean actually a trajectory through first ec economics uh, uh, in England and in Sussex and in, in, in uh, Cambridge, then finance uh, in, in uh, New York, then I would say design. Uh, real estate, but then this becomes something about cities, which becomes something about culture. And so there is this incredible trajectory that goes kind of economics, finance, design, city, uh, culture. Uh, just to give you the most obvious uh, uh, symptoms of this, uh, Soho works with the very best architects in the world and just simply thinks that intelligent development means using the best possible uh, energy from the side of, of architects. Uh, every architect we know is a very difficult person. Um, so this firm is also very expert at dealing with difficult uh, uh, people. But I don't mean here simply uh, all of the best architects in the world. I don't simply mean a list of the great uh, figures like Zaha and so on. But yes, yes, these people too. But probably less noticed, uh, best architects in China are also working with the same firm. Many of them with their first commission was with Soho. So there is also a kind of incubation of, of, of the intelligence of Chinese architects and a kind of rejection of a model that was maybe happening also in the last 20 years, which is some of the best architects in the world uh, have done their worst projects in China. Uh, I, I think with Soho, what's very interesting is you have a series of architects that have done their best projects in China. So China has acted as a, as a kind of form of leverage 
for creativity. That goes against the stereotypes about the world we live in today, about the star system, and even about China uh, uh, itself. Uh, Zhongxin is also an uh, incredibly fierce defender of the idea of cities, of what cities offer, uh, and, and what the density and complexity of a city uh, uh, offers. And then this, of course, becomes uh, uh, obvious that she becomes also a thought leader in terms of culture and defending uh, culture and questions of education, culture, and so on. So basically what I'm telling you is that you're very lucky uh, uh, to have the speaker, and therefore you should be even luckier if I stop talking so she can, <laughs> she can start. But my main point is that this is somebody that just refuses to be boring. She just doesn't want two minutes of her day to be boring. One minute, maybe. But two, no. Two minutes is already something has been lost. So this is somebody whose time is enormously uh, valuable. I'm really thrilled that she's with us here tonight. Has been, uh, without realizing it, a kind of mentor to me as we were working our way uh, around the world, particularly in Beijing. Uh, and I really want to welcome her on behalf of myself, but also the school. Um, and maybe also a little bit from the architectural profession, because uh, it is great to have patrons. It's really important, has always been important for architecture. Architecture is a little bit crazy. It is this idea that a functional object could also be elevating cultural ambition. It's a bit crazy. It always requires uh, the figure of the patron. It's really, really uh, 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 important. And I would say patroness, better. Uh, much better. Um, and I think having welcomed her on behalf of the school, I'd like Vishan to work, welcome uh, her on behalf of the real estate program because it's really, really difficult to imagine somebody who more precisely fits the ambition of the real estate program to completely confuse intelligence about finance with intelligence about design and turn that into intelligence about cities, which is in the end intelligence about culture. So uh, welcome, Vishan. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to be very brief because the, 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 the main act is really to follow. I just want to say this is an extraordinarily celebratory day for us. We have, I, I know that I personally have wanted uh, 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 Zhang Jin to come speak here for many years, so the real estate students who are here this year should feel uh, especially particularly lucky and overjoyed. Um, I would just say that you know when you look at an extraordinary monograph like this and the, 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 the quality, not just of the work, but the quality of the actual document and the care that's put into it, you know that that is a kind of leadership that demands perfection at every level. I have one bone to a, this is a creative source for China. And I would disagree with you because you're a creative source for the world. Uh, and we thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. Uh, please, Zhang Jin. Well, good evening, and thank you very much for the very generous introduction. Uh, the last time I was here at Columbia was probably over 10 years ago. I, I remember I came here one day uh, with a conference, and, and you know, it's just been so long. And today, as I was walking in and admiring the architecture surrounding this and thinking, when was this built? Was it 100 years ago? Uh, I'm walking through the courtyards and beautiful and you know every architecture was built at the time for some reason but today when hundred years later I'm sure at the time whoever built it did not think about how it would be used and how people would look at it but I walked through and thinking bravo that was beautifully built um, what do I do Ashley I do Oh, you've gone to the back. Oh, no. We might need a text. Well, my name is Zhang Xin, and I'm the CEO of Soho China. Uh, You see this one, this is me and my husband started this uh, uh, company about 18 years ago. And uh, when we started out, of course, we didn't know that where we're going. 
Uh, little did we know that we're actually were the luckiest business people as a developer on the planet because uh, China is about to start its most intense urbanization. So we were very uh, privileged to be part of this process. Um, we have since, you know, from the two of us today, have become the largest uh, office builder developer in China. Our work is mostly focused in Beijing and Shanghai. We have built and developed uh, over 58 million square feet, uh, of which 20 million is held as our investment portfolio. Over the years, we have worked with a lot of different architects, uh, and you can see this body of work has really represented a different time, uh, our thinking and our knowledge about the creativity, uh, our ability to create, and, and our, our opportunity uh, with the city uh, to do something. Um, it's just a very special moment in China's history where so much is being built, and we were just in the right moment and, uh, and you know, the, the right place. Now, the, those body of work was actually created by all these architects and even more. We, I didn't have enough space to put everybody's, but you probably recognize most of them, and they come from all over the world, and we bring them to China. So much of our work is about, when we think about in this intense period of urbanization, what can we do? Uh, we, we want to bring the best architectural language around the world to China, so then it can represent uh, our time of today. Uh, but as a developer, you really don't need to do so much architectural work. So where does the aspiration for design and architecture came from? So I wanted to share with you a very personal story and how I began this journey. Back in 2000, uh, 1997, uh, I had an opportunity to visit this area in the mountain where I, uh, I was told that I could actually build a house. I had never built anything in my life. Uh, I was very excited. Uh, and I thought this was a beautiful place and I shall build my dream house. I didn't know what was, what's the process of building, and I thought, what is the best house I have ever seen and imagined? Uh, and I realized that in my memory, the first image came out is the Suzhou Courtyard. For those of you who've been to Suzhou, uh, probably would know. So I flew, da flew down to Suzhou, uh, visited the courtyards, took a lot of photos, and thinking, this is great. I'm going to build a Suzhou courtyard right in the mountain. I came back to Beijing. I found a local architect. I told him, I want exactly like this. You just copy everything. So he did everything perfectly. And I was very excited. I took the drawings, the, the renderings, to the village. Uh, now, this village is very remote. It's about an hour and a half drive from Beijing with a view of the Great Wall. Somehow, this village uh, had an artist. Uh, he's kind of a self-imposed planner controller for the village. So the villager told me, if you want to build a house, you really need to get this person's blessing. So I thought, okay. So I was very proud, and I went to see him. He took a look at the design, and he was very angry. And he said, I just cannot believe that you want to just copy a Suzhou Yuanlin, Suzhou courtyard in this mountain. There's nothing in this mountain that fits a Suzhou courtyard idea. Suzhou courtyard is built in a very moist environment, so therefore lots of vegetations and gardens. Here, what do you have? We have mountains and rocks. Uh, and, and you know, you live in contemporary world. All you want to do is to copy. Uh, I thought, this person is quite uh, rude. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, who is this guy? You know, why do I need his approval for this? I'm building my own house, right? Uh, but, so I was very angry. I, so as, as angry as he was, I drove away. I remember hitting the rock on the way back. But actually, his words really hit me. 
And I was thinking, perhaps he was right, you know, perhaps this is wrong to think about building a dream house as a copy of something. Uh, so when I got back to Beijing, I uh, happened to see a friend of mine who's an artist. By now, he's China's, one of China's best known artists called Zeng Fan Zhi. If you know that he had, last week, his work had just been auctioned for the highest price ever uh, from a Chinese living artist. Anyway, so I'm, I saw him and I told him this story. I said, do you know this artist? And you know, who the hell is he? He was giving me a hard time. And, and then um, Zeng, Zeng Fan Zhi said, perhaps what you should do is to really f find another architect. I know somebody uh, who just came back from the US. Uh, he's struggling with looking for work and you may want to meet him. Now that person happened to be Yang Ho Chang. So that was the first architect I met in my life. So I went to Yang Ho and I remember at the time, uh, his studio was so tiny, it was in these, one of these communist party buildings where you need to pass through these very smelly toilets, go into the corridor, and to the end, very end, it was his studio. I walk in and I said, oh, I have a piece of land and I, I need an architect to help me to build. So I drove him to this place, go back. I drove him to this place. Uh, at the time, there was no this building. And, and so he said, what do you want to do in this place? And I said, well, this place is so beautiful, right? I want to come to see, to, to just look at the mountains. So he said, oh, you just want something to cover it so that under the rain, under the snow, you can still look at the view. So here he designed this house. I think it was his first house uh, in China, and it was first certainly my house, uh, you know, when I began this. Since then, I have, you know, this is the inside of the house. Uh, the idea was very, the concept was very simple. It was a big roof. Underneath the roof, there are lots of little boxes. Uh, so that was the first house. Now from that project, I actually, uh, after I've done that project, I realize how much I love the whole creative process of design and building. Uh, and I realized that you know, I have the perfect job because my daytime job is just about building. Uh, then after that building, also a lot of architects came to visit, especially the local Chinese architects had heard about this house and wanted to come to see it. So many requests that the, to the point that I had to say no, because this is where we live. We cannot, this cannot become a museum or, or workshop. Uh, so we, I decided that we should do a bigger project with the same idea. Then it came, Call You by the Great Wall. So again, I went back to Yang Ho and say, shall we invite 100 architects and give them a site and each to design something amazing? So we found a piece of land uh, by the Great Wall, uh, then it, I soon realized 100 architect, meaning 100 projects happening simultaneously is impossible. So we reduced that number down to 12 Asian, at the time, young architects. And the result is this. So these houses are nestled in the mountains, nearly all of them with a great you know, view of the Great Wall. And many of them at the time were really very young, and now they've become, for instance, Shigeru Ben. I don't know if you guys know about Shigeru. At the time, he was building his paper house. So he had never been to China. Uh, so I took him there, and, and Kango Kuma, later we've, we've become great friends and work on many projects. It was his first time visiting China, both of them. Uh, we also have Yang Ho, we have Cui Kai, who by now have become China's most acclaimed architects. So this is the result. This is actually by one of my favorite architects. Uh, he's from South Korea called Mr. Song. And this is in the winter. Uh, 
and we added more after, the, uh, after we won the Venice Biennale uh, Architectural uh, Special Patron Award, and we added more to this because there were more and more people wanted to come in to, to visit. Today, this place serves as a resort, so all of you are most welcome to come to visit. We have a private pass to the Great Wall, and for those who love architecture, there are lots of little intricacies and between the houses you will discover. This is by the one and only uh, lady architect from Thailand. Oh, that's the day when I was given the award in Venice. In the same time, while we were building the commune by the Great Wall, uh, my we had an opportunity to build in Beijing one of the largest developments in my life. Uh, this project was actually, when we took over, it was China's largest machine tool factories. It's, uh, when you go back to Beijing, when you go to Beijing now, you would not believe where the CBD is, the center of the city is now. At the time, it was mainly factories. They were all like this. That was the day we demolished the factory. And then we built this. This was actually designed by Riken Yamamoto, a Japanese architect. I, I personally like the simplicity of the language and the repetitive of the language makes it very powerful, from the low to the medium to the high. And he turned the building 45 degree uh, away from the straight north and south. So it makes the building, when you see it in a group, it's quite interesting. And that was the day when we opened the project. And those people, there were a lot of people that, half of them are uh, workers who helped to build this building. I actually live in one of the buildings here. Now, this is the uh, Korean architect I mentioned, uh, Mr. Song. He, uh, he then did this project with us. Uh, this is where our office is. So this is when we, before we build a building, we usually always first build a showroom and this is the showroom uh, and where we uh, had the architecture exhibition uh, showing Mr. Song's work. This one is right in the heart of San Litun, which is the very commercial area and, and today a lot of the young people like to hang out. Uh, and there we were, uh, again, we bought this project from someone else when the land was already cleared. And it, we were given the uh, set of zoning criteria, which was quite difficult, because when we look at it, the density is high and the um, plot ratio is high. And, and so we, were, we didn't quite know what was the best way of doing it. So we, we held many rounds of competitions uh, because I was just not happy with the result, not happy with the result, uh, as always. And uh, we, we keep on pushing back and say, this is no good, no good. And I, I also Paul, one or two of the architects on the side started working with them because as you begin to work, you realize that there's never quite a one way of getting the best design. Uh, yeah, now is competition, the, the best way is not, but it has its merit. Uh, but if you only rely on competition, sometimes what if you don't get the best thing? So you have to, I mean, we use all kinds of methods to really push and pull and really get to this result. This is a, in the end, this really came as a combination of our own ideas, the, uh, and then Kengo Kuma's, uh, but it was beautifully executed. Uh, and then this today stands there. You really don't feel the density when you get there because of the shape of the building. Had it been a square box, you probably would feel quite dense. And very simple. We also have a very simple rule is um, 
all the materials are made in China. They have to be made in China. They have to be able to be produced in China. Because if we have to wait for this material to be shipped from Italy, that material to be shipped from Germany, nothing gets done. So we always, and we know that most things can be made in China. And this is a constant dialogue we have with the architects is what material to choose that the Chinese manufacturers knows how to manufacture and they can do it in a large scale because our projects are so large. Like this project uh, is close to, uh, I think this is probably 4.5, 4. 4. right? Oh, good. <laughs> so it's about yeah, 4.5, uh, oh, f actually 5 million square feet, I think. Um, so a, a project of this size, it has to handle, and, and under the speed in China, you know, we were given very tight timing usually. The material, the suppliers, the vendors all need to support this. So if one or two vendors are too far away or cannot install uh, or the materials doesn't come in in time, it will just mess up the whole process. So everything you see here, the design comes from all over the world. But actually, the manufacturing, it's all made in China. I love this photo. This is the day when we opened, and one of the neighboring uh, old men just reading a newspaper there. And Ken Kuma's idea here is just to have a fabric that covers everything, plus the flooring, plus the landscape, uh, and the roof. And this is inside. Uh, you know, the Japanese architects have something very unique. It's their understanding of minimalism is unique. I think no other architects understand minimalism and to that level of purity. And now this is, you can simply see that it's a very simple material that Kengo Kuma used and, and it creates this extraordinary, extraordinarily beautiful space. This is another material. Then in between, we had many other projects. I don't have the time to show too many of them to you. Uh, and then 2008, we, uh, we had an opportunity to build another major development in Beijing. Um, and this time, uh, many years ago, I had tried to work with Zaha Hadid, didn't work. Uh, she was too difficult, I was too stubborn. Uh, <laughs> and so it didn't work out. And years later, when I had an opportunity to do this, and I thought about Zaha, I thought maybe this is the time to think about Zaha. So I call her up and say, I have this project. Uh, would you like to, do you have the interest? She has also shown me her office has really grown to be quite mature and very different from many years ago when both of us were impossible to work together. So this become one of the happiest moments in our working professional relationship between me and Zaha. And right now, this was completed last year, right in the heart of Beijing on Second Ring Road. It's called Galaxy. And it, from the outside, is really quite simple. But if you walk in, I mean, this is from the road. Uh, and I love this photo, this is actually taken by Jerry, because this has the contrast between a nearby temple and, and this building. And this is the inside. When you're actually walking in, you will see how dynamic the space is, how interesting it is. It's not at all how you imagine from the outside. Two days ago, the British uh, finance minister, George Osborne, was in Beijing, so he went to visit this as a support to British talent working in China, because Zaha is considered British talent. And I think he was overwhelmed by seeing this. This is really a great photo, too, is, uh, you know, people playing mahjong on the street, and yet this... <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is Jerry. Jerry is a great photographer, in addition to being a great architect. And this is the interior. 
you know, again, all of this was achieved. Oh, I want to share with you this. Zaha's language, right? when we first saw this, we thought, how do we build this? This is so hard. She has never done anything of this scale, right? Now, this thing, in a smaller scale, in an experimental spirit, you would use a lot of materials that are for small scale. So when the, their studio proposed the material, I took a look and thought, none of this can be used. Because if we were to go down that road, all those materials, first of all, it would take us years to find them. It would take us years to negotiate because they're one vendor. How do we get the price down? And, and also, it would be impossible for our contractors to work on them, to build them. So then we, this is a process of a collaboration between us and then we kept on thinking what are the materials that can be done in China and yet serves the purpose of this fluid language. And then we found, uh, so this ribbon is actually all aluminum. It's very simple in the end. It's nothing that the Chinese worker cannot do or the vendors don't know how to produce. There's some areas where you need to do uh, double curve, like do you see that on the top? That's about the only area that's difficult. And then we can just focus on that little difficult area, but vast majority is quite simple uh, to be built. So that's always a trick, because sometimes when, uh, oh, actually w when we started working with Zaha, she had just completed the building, the Guangzhou Opera House. Uh, Jerry and I, our team, we went down to study, research, study, uh, discuss three times, and, and we thought the problem with the, a lot of people complain and say that the quality wasn't so good. The problem with that wasn't so much the design, it was the choice of material. It was way too challenging for Chinese workers to get it right, and for Chinese vendors to get it right. So we learned from that experience, and so here we try to avoid all the mistakes that we saw in that project. And then right after that, um, we had another opportunity and we held a competition. Many world-renowned architects came and, and guess what? Zaha won the competition again. Wasn't, it was, I swear to God, it wasn't by design. It just, her design stood out so much stronger than the others. Uh, these are over five million square feet office building. Um, when you come out from the airport, when you look on the we look towards the west, Wangjing, this is the first uh, image you will see. Uh, so it, it, it served quite well for welcoming the guests coming to Beijing. We're almost done. This photo was probably taken a month ago? One week ago. One, two weeks ago. Uh, again by Jerry. See, he's taking photos now. <laughs> That's from the top. And you see this landscape, right? How beautiful is the landscape, the curves, and, and just the same language as the architecture. Um, it, it really feels a monument as you, as you get you know, closer to this. Actually, I, when I walk in, I was there a week ago, I find it hard to take a view and, because it's so monumental, so big, when you're actually there, you feel so small. You need a little bit distance to see this. Um, but <coughs> so this was the, the sh uh, you know, showroom. We, built, we always built the showroom because we needed to test the material, test the design, and also introduce the idea, the concept to the market and see how the market gets excited or hates it. In this case, that people love it. Uh, one of the most popular movies recently released, uh, for the Chinese students who know this, a lot of it was shot there. If, uh, if you go back and see their office, the, the school, the language school, was all there. <laughs> yes. The, so it was all taken here. This was another Zaha project. 
You must wonder what happened to us. <laughs> I mean, not that uh, we don't want to continue to bring variety of languages, we do. But in this case, again, it was a competition, fiercely competitive competition. And her skin was, again, just by far the most outstanding. Uh, that was a hard one, because we were very split in, in decision. Um, this was in Shanghai. When you come out from the airport, uh, and the first you see will be this. And just look at how this building varies in image from the rest of the city fabric. Um, I just love it. And, and you can really, this is in distance. And, and when you get closer, this rendering, again, the size is big. You know, I like everything. China's size is just massive. But this is all rendering. Uh, well, I was on site probably two weeks ago. It was like this. Uh, we should finish uh, next year. So when you come to Shanghai or visit Shanghai, and please give us a call. You're most welcome to visit this. The, the, the language is so dynamic. There are all these bridges. Also office. This, these are all office buildings. Um, That's the interior. Um, we just finished this uh, showroom. Uh, well, that was pretty much, I show you just a, 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 some of our projects, but I wanted to uh, just take this opportunity to tell you the joy that I have working with the great architects for this creative work. Uh, and I think that, um, if you look at cities, right, cities, great cities like New York City or Paris, all those cities have an intense period of urbanization. And this is the moment for China, for cities like Beijing and Shanghai, many other cities in China. It is this very intense period of urbanization. Uh, you know, architecture has this amazing character, which is it serves the immediate functional purpose, but it also leaves the legacy for the future. Like today, when we go to see this, visit these uh, cultural heritage, it's like the Great Wall. It was built, obviously, for different purpose at the time. And the people who built it then did not think like a thousand years later how it would be viewed and so on. But it nevertheless embodies then the history, the purpose, and it becomes a rich part of our cultural heritage. So I think that uh, when I look back, what we do. And when I think about the test for me to make a, a final decision on which to build, which to choose. And always I come to the same uh, thinking, which is if one day I bring my grandchildren to visit, would I be very proud? Have I done the best at the time? And I want to be that very proud person. Thank you. Hoping for questions. Uh, who would like to start? Yes, on the on the left. We have a microphone, so you can. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your investment here? What's your strategy? Thank you. <laughs> Are you sent by Michael Bloomberg? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not much strategy. I was just intrigued by, uh, you know, we of course need to diversify investment and there isn't much of a building opportunity in this city, as you know. Uh, the city is built and it, it, there's very, very little land left you can continue to build. So when we come in here, we just buy the existing buildings. Uh, so that's that was the only strategy I had. Thanks again. Um, would you please elaborate on 
what your first project was. You explained that the house, the beautiful home that you showed us was, I think, a couple of years after you had started the company in 95. So what was the very first project in your real estate firm that you sort of uh, l launched the rest of your career? Uh, the one I showed earlier, the Riku Yamamoto one, oh no, that before that we didn't have it, it's called Xiandai Cheng Soho New Town. That was the very first one we, I worked on. Uh, we didn't show you that one. How big is it? Maybe not. not yeah. yeah. We are on. It's okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, how did the project start? It was that project was on the site used to be a rice wine factory, and because this whole area of CBD needed to be old factories needed to be relocated out and then to give the clear land for office buildings, commercial buildings to be built. So we had the opportunity to do that. And so that was then uh, quite, a, actually it was quite a bit of residential. We started out doing a lot of residential. And then uh, later we were, I realized that in the city center, uh, residentials are leased out as small offices. Then we started building these small office, home office. That's why we're called Soho. Uh, so that was all in that project. Uh, we continued to build this Soho for many, many years. Like the one that designed by uh, Riken Yamamoto, Jianwai Soho, it was a Soho building. So there were lots of small offices and, but funny enough, like, um, not many people lived there. Even though it was designed as a Soho, but still, there's just a lot of offices. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so the bulk of your portfolio started in Beijing and now I see you're starting to expand to Shanghai. What do you see sort of as um, then the development, the sort of timeline into maybe smaller and second tier cities? As you know, right now there's not really that much, I would say, you know, big international design projects as much as larger corporate, you know, corporate towers. I'm sure there's an SOM tower in every, you know, like Nanjing or Suzhou going underway. But what do you see sort of as a timeline and sort of the path to bring more design into these cities? Oh, the second and third tier cities are quite vibrant. There are a lot of, uh, I was at Stephen Hall's studio this morning and he showed me this Chengdu project he just yeah. finished. Huge. Huge and beautiful. And I think secondary cities has just as many, you know, creative power uh, and, and large scale. Uh, so, and capital. And so that's, it's all there. The, the great thing about our time is uh, our ability to build, it's so huge, to produce is so huge. Cities are literally get built within 10 years. So if I haven't been to a city for 10 years, the chances are I would go in, it's all built. Hi, Ms. Zhang. Uh, actually, my name is Xiao Ting, and I work at Bank of China, New York branch. And I think my manager met you before. Uh, it's <laughs> it's, uh, his name is Xiao Lei, and uh, he is like, actually, he's on the business right now in Beijing, and he would like to say hello to you. And I actually, saw him last week. Chole, you saw him last week? Yeah, <laughs> great. And uh, um, actually, as a student here, and we really take you as a, a role model like for us as a Chinese student and a worker in this industry. And uh, uh, we do like um, particularly interested in your decision making ability. I mean, particularly in those big uh, significant scale projects. How do you make the decision at the at each time and to make it to be innovative, but it's also acceptable by the, mar by the market and to make the economic uh, science. 
and we could you talk about something like that? Thank you. I think the, first of all, we're lucky in China. The market, or generally the society, uh, is very receptive of new things. And people just love new things, new ideas, therefore new designs, new models. And everybody is trying something new, and whether it's in business, in design, in everything, right? Because uh, we're, we're you know, just moving, the country's moving so fast from the old system to the new one. And, and the sense and the spirit of experiment is very strong. Uh, now, sometimes, I go to another city, I can see that the, you know, for instance, New York City, this strong sense of uh, tradition uh, makes it hard. You know, when you love your tradition so much, uh, and then it makes the people who are doing, trying to create new things a little harder. Uh, and I think that's why architects find so much work in China very hard to find it, uh, you know, in, in this city, for instance. Of course, there's very little to build, but when there's something being built, you can see that in you know, the World Trade Center and so on, they don't go to the kind of architects who really represents the most cutting edge ideas. Uh, and I think that's, that's something to do with the conservative, uh, the strong conservative force uh, in, this, in this society. Hi, Ms. Zhang. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, so a lot of your projects are very spectacular objects on their own. But um, as we saw in the, uh, I think it's the Sky Soho object, when, when it's placed in its local context, it really poses a very stark contrast with the existing urban environment. So do you think Soho is just very forward looking in its inception of these projects and the local development is going to catch up? In, uh, catch up? Um, eventually, or do you think when you look back uh, at these projects in 20 years, you're going to have certain regrets on the kind of disruptions of the local life that these projects might have caused? Uh, I think there are a lot of local developers doing interesting work. We are by no means the only people. We may start early, but by now, really, there were many, many commune by the Great Walls, but by different places but similar ideas of inviting many creative architects to do different things. Uh, and, and, you know, China has just become a, a, a place that embraces the most uh, incredible uh, creativity, architectural creativity. And I think, uh, so that's, that's really not unique just about, I mean, it wouldn't have been only Soho China. There are lots and lots of developers, governments, just generally, when they think about design, at build, building something, they would go and invite the best architects around the world to come to China. See, that is amazing, you think about it, you know, because many of the people have never lived outside, I mean, I have the benefit of lived and studied and worked outside China, but many of these people never lived outside China, don't speak English, and yet still go on that road of doing this, and that's really remarkable. I think it's something about China that is people are daring uh, and not just want to, you know, stick to what they know and, and go into the unknown. So that's on that. Uh, in terms of whether we would regret in the context of local, I don't really know what's a local context anymore because there's such a variety of language, such variety of design and architecture and, and you know, you really, if you see today what uh, Stephen Hall showed me, the Chengdu project, now that is a, you know, that, that contrast between the old city and that structure is immense. And I thought, uh, I, I haven't been to the, but just from the photos, I just thought it was quite amazing. Uh, we live in a globalized environment. And what does globalization mean? That it's just, things are not so local. Like, maybe 100 years ago in Beijing, you only see Si He Yuan, because people don't have much information outside. Uh, but we don't. We, we don't live in that environment anymore. So I think what is available here will be quickly available elsewhere. So that's, that's really the character. I think the variety is, is the character of today. Maybe we could try to get to the back.
Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to say it's, it's great to see a fellow Cambridge alum here in New York. Uh, oh. so that's fantastic. Um, so my question is this. Now, now we notice it's sort of like there's a strategy shift over the years for Soho China. So Can you one, speak up a bit? Sure. So, so we notice there's like a strategy shift for your business focus over the years. Uh, so Soho China used to be like purely we build the commercial real estate property, we sell it. And but now you know you guys start to sort of like try, try to be the landlord and to own some of the property and then just lease it out. Um, so w w where does the strategy come from? Like what's the rationale behind that? And two is that uh, so we, we see you guys from purely commercial real estate like a, like um, a property developer to so like you know branching out to like uh, mixed use residential, a little bit residential. So going forward, like are you gonna make a lot of stuff like in the residential sector or like still like like focus on the commercial but you know maybe some mixed use stuff thank you uh, we our history is that we started with residential then we move on to do these soho because we realize that these residentials are used by small offices anyway then we move on to do office uh, well, the early days in our office, we would sell strata title sell, meaning floor by floor sell to individual owners. So these are multi-owner buildings by the time we finish. Uh, and then to the very last model, which is now, that we actually own all the buildings we've built. So this has been an evolution. Uh, the, the company evolution really represents the capital market uh, environment, what's the, you know, where does the funding, source of funding come from? In the early days, there was just not many source of funding. Uh, and so if you want to build a building, uh, you have to, largely it was uh, equity based to get the land, and then very little debt. Uh, and so developers were all re relying on pre sale. So the earlier you can pre sale, the earlier you can get the money back and the quicker you can get the building built. So this is why Chinese developers are all very good at creating showrooms, launching to the market very quickly to pre-sell the good ones. I mean, I remember there were days we used to sell the whole building within a few days. Uh, we were probably by far the fastest in terms of pre-sell. Uh, so that was then. Uh, right now, you know, China has moved and developed. The capital market has also developed. The international capital market also opened to, uh, to Chinese companies. We went public, uh, listed in Hong Kong in 2007. We, we raised 1.9 billion U.S. dollar. It was then, still is, the largest uh, private IPO for an Asian uh, developer. So... Uh, these, once the capital market opens, then you can do all kinds of funding. You can raise equity, debt, CB, and all kinds of things. And at and, and, and the same time, international commercial banks are also lending. Uh, they, you know, we, we just completed a syndicated loan about a week ago. Uh, again, a billion dollar syndicated loan. Uh, and then it, because the Chinese banks realize that they need to compete with all these international banks, they all also come up with a, a, a lot of lending. So those opportunities of financing are available today that wasn't available um, 18 years ago when I started out. Also, we made this shift, not only just the capital markets environment, but also our own firm started out, we were small, we had a very little capital, I mean equity base. Over the years, uh, we built a lot, sold a lot, made a lot of profit. Our equity base has become so big. It allows us to shift to this model, which is build, because it build and hold. When you hold and held these uh, investments, you have to have a, a quite a, a large equi equity base. Bear in mind that China doesn't really have a REIT system, so you cannot really do a REIT. Uh, it has to be equity base, and so to do what we do now, which is holding investment properties, you've got to have a reasonably big equity base. You've got to have a very vibrant uh, capital markets environment. Also, you need to have deep enough leasing market to really support it. And this is why we are very narrowly focused in Beijing and Shanghai, because these are the two markets that, despite of the supply, still has deep enough demand that we feel comfortable. 
further back you go, the better. Uh, hi, Tong. Uh, I would like to thank you for a really great lecture. Also, good length. And I have to say that it's not often that we have the chance to be seated with such a great variety of students from uh, architecture and business and real estate. And I guess I'll be uh, very pleased. So I thank you for bringing us all together today. Um, I grew up in Beijing, actually, in the 90s. You grew up in Beijing? I did. Ah. So uh, Sandy Tun is where I used to buy Beanie Babies for 25 cents as a child <laughs> uh, before the Kangol Kumat building. Um, and I guess um, there's a lot of things that I would like to ask you about, but perhaps uh, the one thing I would like to point to is um, as we speak of cities that are in global competition, uh, also, you know, as we look at all the work you've been commissioning to really place Beijing on the map as a place of um, like quality architecture. Um, I wonder, uh, so right now there's this big uh, project in New York called the Plan NYC SIRR, directed by Bloomberg. And it's really an important leadership event because it's uh, visionary in the sense that it um, relates to, like really sets a common goal for all the people that act on the built environment and tries to tackle you know, issues like climate change. We had Sandy just a year ago. Um, so as China is an important uh, model of uh, climate change as well, I wonder whether you know that that is being tackled or you would be interested in tackling uh, this kind of challenge. Because um, I think you might be one of the only people who have this capacity to kind of bring uh, this thing forward? Well, you all heard that Beijing has become one of the most polluted cities in the world. And for us who live and work there, chalk with the bad air, uh, we couldn't help to think, what can we do to, to, to improve this? So not so much green environment that you were talking about, but it's also related to the environment. And in building these buildings, so right now, we have two, two things that are characters of Soho buildings. One is these architectural uh, features. Another is uh, we have came up with a solution for air quality. So all of our buildings are PM 2.5 filtered. Uh, so we realize that you know if you think about a human being, you're probably 80% or 90% of the time staying indoor. Uh, I'm talking about adults. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so if we can somehow find a way to purify the air indoor, whether it's in your living environment or working environment or shopping environment, uh, you're actually okay. I mean, like I, I'm a runner. Every morning I need to check, is the air quality okay for me to run outdoor? Uh, you know, 30% of the time, I would say this is not good. So I will run indoor. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the kind of, uh, uh, you know, we see this as a, 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 first it was a terrible problem. And, and quickly we realized this is also something, it gave us an opportunity to be creative, to come up with a solution. So that's something we have done. And, and I think we're just about, we're at the moment experimenting uh, with uh, one of the vendors on, uh, I don't know, Gavin Schneider, let me talk to you. And, uh, energy cons consumption, yeah. Energy efficiency. So we're trying to work with one of the vendors and see how can we work in a building to be energy efficient. All of our buildings now are LEED certified. But that's not good enough. And we want it to be more than, I mean, LEED certified is a very standard thing. You do this, you do that. But actually, there are new technologies came out and that can constantly, constantly push it better. So we are just began this process working with uh, Schneider. And to, to we, it, very soon, our energy efficiency center will be built. We'll see how that would work. Because the air purification, the PM 2.5 filtered, also took us two years to get there. It was an experiment. We worked with many vendors, and then again, you know, not successful. 
went back to them, push it back, and, and eventually get to this point. Mm. I can see that you're very sorry, knowledgeable. Sorry to be rude, but you have some fellow students who would like to ask questions. Good evening. Thank you very much. My observation of your uh, buildings are very bold and challenging. And my question is, have you found the tendency to be intimidated by some of this architecture? And the other question is, with such big projects, I don't see any retail in any of these. And how are you supporting the populace that's within the buildings? And are they on higher floors, above street level, things like that? Thank you. Uh, I don't think tenants are, what's the word, intimidated, you said, uh, by, by architecture. I mean, on the other hand, I think people love it. But of course, it attracts certain tenants, not everybody's. There are some very traditional ones, they wouldn't choose our building. So they are ones who love our building. And we were talking about it today that nearly, uh, if you look at the architects firms, creative firms, most of them are in Soho buildings. Uh, and it's very natural because you know people who love design, architecture, and, uh, and would find this environment interesting. Um, so that we, our building's language self-select its tenant. Uh, retail, we just don't do. We, we do, we have one retail, pure retail project on Tianmen, the south of Tiananmen Square. Otherwise, we basically don't do much retail. We're all office. Uh, to the extent that, you know, maybe in the basement, at the first level, we have some retails and to serve the building. Uh, but we don't really have a designated retail project. So there's going to be maybe a couple more questions. Thank you. Hi. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the Cultural Revolution affected you? I know you can probably give a whole lecture on that, but... Um, I, I just didn't hear prepare stories. for that. <laughs> <laughs> I just hear, hear stories from my parents, and I'm, obviously you're much younger than my parents, but... Um, how do you see your buildings of building in New China? Or do you see your buildings building in New China? What's the question? Do you see yourself as building in New China? Oh, I see. Uh, well, I, I'm part of this process of building in New China. I mean, all of us who work in this uh, environment are... Uh, you know, I, I look at Beijing and Shanghai today. When, when we started out nearly 20 years ago, 18 years ago, there was hardly anything. But by now, there's so much being built. It's probably coming to the end of the intense building time. So it, you know, I've just been lucky uh, that uh, you know, it happens to be the last 20 years are my most productive years. So that's just, uh, I've been lucky. So it is part of the new China that, uh, I mean, I was born and grew up uh, during the Cultural Revolution. We did not grow up with any of these statics. In fact, we, if you have seen any of the photos of the Cultural Revolution, it's these very monotoned, Russian-styled buildings. And, and socialist has a, a peculiar way of uh, cutting down characters into uniformed creatures. Uh, so I grew up that way. Uh, and maybe it was because of that. And China now craves for new things, craves for creativities. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's what I really appreciate when I step out of China. And I know that how special it is, uh, you know, to be able to work in China at this moment as a developer. So maybe the last question. I'm not too Well, can I ask the last question? Yeah. Um, uh, from the presentation, we can see a sweep of the architectural design. And, and I remember you mentioned that the Chinese people is not actually doing Soho in these buildings. So along with the architectural design shift, is there a shift in the program that, that makes the, the, the market targeting a little different from the first one? And it, are you... Do you have any uh, future plans for new Soho? Or uh, I'm not mean to be offensive, but offensive. But um, the Soho idea is quite new, and when the first one is built, and now it's becoming more common. I think. I think. So to be creative, will you 
get a, a shift in the program and the market targeting or even change the name of the Soho in the future plan. So the question is, what is your secret future business plan for Soho? <laughs> <laughs> We don't do Soho anymore, you know, we do pure office. Actually, all of these buildings you're seeing now, they're just pure office buildings. So we are, we've now, we call ourselves China's largest prime office developer. Uh, we really don't do residential, we don't do Soho. We don't do uh, uh, retail. We still call Soho, because that's how, how we became known. And you, I think we're, as a company too old to change our name, so we will continue to be called Soho. Future, I haven't really thought about it so much. You know, I'm, I'm um, just doing, uh, we have 12 projects in Shanghai, and you know, these, and, and then quite a few in Beijing, so we have a lot of buildings still going on. So for the next three years, we're still busy building, and these opportunities are still there. Now, whether after that there will be opportunities in other cities or other countries, I don't know. So for today, I haven't really seen opportunities outside of Beijing and Shanghai are as attractive. And that's why we're now going to those cities in, in secondary or third tier cities. We constantly evaluate those opportunities, but we still always come back and assessing the risks and so on, thinking still Beijing and Shanghai are are better and safer environments for us. Well, thank you. So, just again to express our great th thanks, but to note uh, that the first word in the name of Soho is small. Um, but now five million square feet seems to be uh, small. Uh, and the last words of the lecture, which were about uh, grandchildren, and I think it, in, this, in this way it's very, very interesting to see how y your company has very quickly reached the kind of uh, phil philosophical position that we know of in the great real estate families of New York, that, that it's about grandchildren. So this, uh, this, it, really, it really is for the future, for generations. No? So, so in, this sense, uh, in this sense, it's really amazing to see an experiment in speed become also uh, an experiment in generations. So in, in answer, in, to answer for you about the last question, for sure there is another Soho coming, but as with everything that Soho has done so far, when it hits, it's going to hit hard, and many of your competitors will wish they had thought of it, and maybe they will not think of it because they have not been in dialogue with the wonderful people like Zaha Hadid that open your eyes, and I think the best that we can offer as architects is to open the eyes and the combination of an architect with her eyes unbelievably open, with a patron who's also unbelievably open, and they have sorted out ways of reinventing architecture and finance at the same time, uh, it's something we dream about. So this was a dream evening for us. Thank you so much. <laughs>